Um, one other uh, protein question that came my way it came from social media. I forget exactly who asked it, um, but I, I'm basically using it purely to prove a point. To, to, <laughs> I'm being too honest today, aren't I? i uh, using it to reinforce a point, but I will answer the question. Uh, so the question was, uh, there was a new study that came out showing that higher protein intake uh, in the form of essential amino acid supplementation, I believe, did not lead to higher uh, rates of muscle protein synthesis during energy restriction. So does this mean that our protein needs are unchanged by caloric restriction, regardless of the magnitude of the energy deficit? And, you know, this was something that surprised readers because, uh, you know, the general kind of typical advice is if you're going to be in a big deficit, you might want to bump up protein a little bit. You know, uh, if you're, especially if you're very lean in a big deficit, protein needs will probably bump up a little bit. Um, what was really interesting is you look at the study and muscle protein synthesis rates uh, were not different, but whole body protein balance was. We, there was a collection of different measurements they took to, to approximate, you know, what's our balance here of anabolic, catabolic processes related to body protein. And the last sentence of the paper itself is taken together. These results suggest that higher essential amino acid doses are necessary to optimize both muscle and whole body protein status during the catabolic stress of underfeeding. And you listen to that statement and you contrast it with the finding that energy restriction did not appear to, to, or, you know, high versus low protein in, in the, in the uh, case of this energy restriction, it didn't seem to matter for muscle protein synthesis rates. And yet the take home point was you're going to want to bump up your protein if you're restricting energy. And I think that, that contrast throws a lot of people for a loop. And I think it highlights a really critical distinction between looking at muscle protein synthesis and assuming that it absolutely necessarily represents long-term hypertrophy. I think a lot of people have gotten it in their mind. If something increases muscle protein synthesis, if A increases MPS more than B does, then A is better for hypertrophy, period. I have the proof. It's data, right? But there are many instances in the literature where that doesn't work out. It, it breaks down. And if you were to interpret some of these muscle protein synthesis papers at face value, you would make uh, some conclusions that are erroneous. They, they don't, it's not just that they didn't pan out. It's that they don't have face validity they, uh, on their surface. They don't seem right because they aren't right. So like you could look at acute muscle protein synthesis data and there's literally a paper that would indicate if taken at face value, that for an obese individual doing a, a unilateral study design, their leg that doesn't lift should grow more muscle than their leg that does. No one would accept that at face value. But if you look at the way the muscle protein synthesis data is presented, that is the conclusion you'd, you'd have to draw if you're taking it at face value. And you're assuming muscle protein synthesis equals hypertrophy. Yeah, that, that, was, that was one of the studies that we talked about during the whole P ratio back and forth. Exactly. Yeah. And I said, I, I will accept that argument if you will, if you believe that the non-lifting leg should grow more muscle than the lifting leg. I've never met anyone that would take that at face value, right? So you, you have to check yourself with some of these interpretations and make sure that if you're going to take it at face value, you have to take all of it at face value. You know, uh, there, there are similar um, situations with some of the research looking at plant versus animal protein sources where you'll look at, you know, acute muscle protein synthesis data and say, there is an enormous difference between these protein sources. Like this animal based protein source should, should promote so much more hypertrophy than this plant based source. But then when we put them in the context of, you know, whether we're looking at individual supplement interventions or entire diets, that difference that seems huge at the level of muscle protein synthesis really shrinks when you start looking at actual hypertrophy measurements over time. Uh, a different example is with raw versus cooked eggs. Uh, I think it's, 
generally accepted. Maybe research will uh, change our perspective on this in the future, but my general understanding is that raw albumin from egg is far less digestible than cooked albumin. That's my understanding that that I've seen in in studies. I mean that that wasn't Rocky's understanding, but that was not. I mean there there, there are differing opinions. We just want to make it clear this isn't settled science, right? Uh, you know, academic research says one thing. Uh, Balboa et al. have some <laughs> some differing opinions. So do do with that what you will. Yeah, but I mean we're talking about a difference on the order of like ninety percent versus fifty percent mm-hmm. digestibility. Big. Uh, and then a paper comes out showing absolutely no difference in muscle protein synthesis, right? And so we have to be very cautious when we interpret muscle protein synthesis findings. That's not to say that they're not useful. It's not to say they're not informative. It's not to say that the people using them are doing a poor job. But muscle protein synthesis is, by definition, not hypertrophy. Um, and whenever we look at something, a proxy measure, protein quality, protein digestibility, muscle protein synthesis, uh, amino acid composition. We can use that information, but we have to contextualize it and use it very carefully. And we have to continuously cross-reference that with applied studies when they're available, actual longitudinal designs. And there's actually a fantastic review paper that just came out. And the review paper, the title is Making Sense of Muscle Protein Synthesis, a focus on muscle growth during resistance training. So this was one of those things I was starting to feel like a conspiracy theorist, how I would, I got to the point where people would ask me about like, Hey, what's up with this muscle protein synthesis thing? And I'd be like, yeah, I just don't think that has anything to do with hypertrophy, you know? Um, Well, so I, I remember um, a a question that I used to field somewhat frequently after, um, God, I, I forget who the lead author on it was, but there there was a pretty influential narrative review that came out that, that was just about like uh, nutritional things to optimize muscle protein synthesis in lifters. And one of the things that it said was for healthy young people, uh, muscle protein synthesis seems to be maximized with a protein bolus of 0.25 grams per kilogram which if you weigh 80 kilograms would be like 20 grams of protein or something like that. And then I think uh, the paper also recommended four or five uh, protein boluses per day right. to to uh, get you the protein you need and not uh, compact it too much. So you might run into like the muscle full effect and stuff like that. Refractory periods, yeah, yeah. things like that. Yeah, yeah. so... You put those two pieces of information together and we were just arguing that, you know, maybe you can get away with down to about 1.2 grams per kilo of protein. But the the bulk of the research does still suggest that if you want to be better safe than sorry, 1.6. Optimize rather than do good enough. Exactly. Right. Something like 1.6, 2.2, something somewhere in that range tends tends to get you where you want to go. Um, but yeah, if you look at the the data there the acute muscle protein synthesis stuff and the number of protein boluses per day you would say like oh somewhere between 1 and 1.25 grams of protein per kilo of body mass that should maximize hypertrophy which does conflict to some degree with the longitudinal evidence and so people people would ask me about that and they'd be like well what what should what should i put more stock in this muscle protein synthesis stuff or the longitudinal study outcomes and I said, I don't know, man, like call me a rube, but if I want to know about building muscle, I'm going to look at the studies that actually assess building muscle over time. So, um, yeah, th- this is, I-, I think a cyclical conversation comes yeah. up from time to time. And, uh, my opinion is when you have longitudinal studies, you, uh, pay more attention to the longitudinal studies. Right. And, and, and like I said, I was getting to the point where I, I kept, people would say, well, you know, this acute MPS stuff doesn't match up with the longitudinal stuff. And I'd say, then just go with the longitudinal stuff, you know, and, and the, the, just the title of this new review paper kind of, uh, validates that, that fact that a lot of people have been taking this acute mechanistic muscle protein synthesis information and just over extrapolating it into conditions that aren't appropriate and making conclusions that, uh, might not be appropriate based on the study design, based on 
you know, uh, one of the big things that that comes up with these studies, just to put some degree of specificity into the conversation, is like if you're doing a, a single bout of unaccustomed exercise, exercise, and you're looking at immediate muscle protein synthesis response that's going to correlate very poorly with long-term hypertrophy potential. Uh, there's just too much muscle damage going on. It's you're, you're not getting a good snapshot. So there are instances where this muscle protein synthesis data can correlate much better with, with long-term longitudinal outcomes. It's usually uh, people that are not doing unaccustomed exercise, people that are not totally untrained and, you know, engaging in training for the first time, uh, measurements taken over longer time courses rather than just a few hours looking at a snapshot there. So once again, I don't want to discredit the research that's been done on most muscle protein synthesis. It's valuable research. It's informative, but when we have instances where it totally contradicts more applied longitudinal research, um, I'm more inclined to go with the longitudinal stuff, not to say it's perfect, you know, a lot of the measurement techniques that we use uh, for muscle building over, you know, eight, 12 weeks, you could argue eh, those aren't perfectly sensitive. So maybe we have to have some caveats there as well. But getting back to the initial question, you know, when someone says, hey, should I bump up my protein if I'm lifting and I'm, you know, really lean and really restricting? Uh, I'd say, man, our, our good friend, uh, the good Dr. Helms did a pretty good systematic review indicating that in those situations, protein probably ought to be bumped up a little bit. And that was based on some pretty good applied longitudinal designs that I feel really good about. So if I'm looking at, you know, if I've on one hand, I've got the body of literature from a really well done systematic review on those applied trials. And on the other, I've got acute muscle protein synthesis data give me the first one every time, you know, give me the former rather than the latter. So, uh, if you want to look into that review paper, I am going to link it in the show notes. I think it's, I think it's really well done. You know, it, it points out the issues with longitudinal body comp assessments, which are fair. It points out the methodological considerations that could lead to misapplication of muscle protein synthesis data. Uh, overall, very well done and very relevant to that question that I received.